Chuck Hitchcock. I'm the interim dean here at Southampton College. And it's my uh, pleasure to introduce the speaker for this afternoon. For some of us, life-changing experiences come early in life. For our speaker today, Professor Annette Gordon-Reed, such a revelation occurred when she was 12, living at her natal home in East Texas. Her parents had a book entitled White Over Black, which discussed the plight of blacks in the South in the 1800s. Included in the book was a chapter on Thomas Jefferson and his relationship with Sally Hemings. This story fascinated Gordon Reed. Little did she know that this historical event would loom large in her life. Two years later, historian Fawn Brody published the book Thomas Jefferson and Intimate History. She was the first white historian to give credence to the relationship between Jefferson and Hemings. Gordon Reed concealed her status as a minor and successfully joined the Book of the Month Club so that she could receive Brody's biography. The Jefferson Hemings interest continued through a move north to study history at Dartmouth College. And as she discovered how historians looked at their story, she was particularly disturbed by the way most historians and biographers failed to take into account Sally Hemings' importance or to validate the memoirs of her son, Madison Hemings. After college, Gordon Reed went on to Harvard Law School where she was a member of the Law Review. Upon graduation, she spent her early career as an associate at the law firm of Gordon and Rundell and as counsel to the New York City Board of Corrections. Later, she became a professor of law at New York Law School. While teaching a class on persuasion, she decided to use the relationship of Hemings and Jefferson in order to allow her students to understand the subtleties of evidence, facts, and opinions. This classroom exercise stimulated Gordon Reed to write a book about her findings, and the rest is history. Her book, Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemming, An American Controversy, became a bestseller. It set forth a valid proposal that Sally Hemings' children were most likely the result of a union with Thomas Jefferson. A year later, DNA testing suggested strongly that Sally's youngest son, Easton, Eston Hemings, was likely Jefferson's son. Gordon Reed says that her life has been forever changed because of the book. The story certainly took over a large portion of her life. Though since then, she has co-authored with Vernon E. Jordan, Jr., Vernon Can Read, a memoir. And throughout this sojourn, she has been accompanied by her husband, her daughter, and her son. Welcome, Annette Gordon-Reed. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here on this beautiful day, although I feel like saying, as I do to my class, we could have this outside. You know. <laughs> sit under the trees and do this. Um, it's truly gorgeous, and as I said, I'm very happy to be here. I wanted to start off by saying that my interest in Jefferson began just a little bit before I was lying about being a minor and ordering books from the Book of the Month Club. I was in the third grade at Conroe, in Conroe, Texas, at Anderson Elementary School. And it's interesting, we were just discussing this, Robert and I, before we came in, Mr. Hitchcock, before we came in, that growing up in East Texas is a very, very, can be a difficult experience if you're black. It's a very, very hard and can be somewhat mean-spirited part of the country. And I was one of, well, actually, I was the only black child in my elementary school at the time because I had integrated our elementary school and it was something my parents had decided to do um, because they thought it was the right thing to do and that I was the person who could pull this off. And it was a difficult that time. It's not the kind of thing that I think I would, I think about my children now and whether or not I would have done that. I'm glad they did and I, I'm, I appreciate the courage that they showed in doing it. But I was in this school uh, surrounded by white people, white kids, some of whom were very mean and some of whom were very, very nice. Some people actually went out of their way. Their parents went out of their way to tell them that they should befriend me and be kind to me and whatever. So in the, in the face of all of the harshness, I always knew that there were some people out there who were people of goodwill. And so it stopped me from ever thinking that you can generalize about any race of people or any ethnic group. And so I learned that lesson very, very early on. But when I was Ann Anderson in the third grade, I read a biography of Thomas Jefferson, one of those childhood biographies 
children's biographies. I'm sure all of you have seen those. And in the way that they do with children's biographies, things are sort of left out or things are prettied up in a way. But this had an interesting twist to it. In this particular book, which I think must have been written in the 40s or the 50s or something like that, there was um, a slave boy who was supposed to be the counterpart to Jefferson. He was Jefferson's friend. And he was modeled after a real life slave, a man named Jupiter, who had been Jefferson's personal servant from the time he was about nine or 10 years old. And so evidently the author of this book took this real relationship and fictionalized it in telling what was purported to be the biography of Thomas Jefferson. And in this biography, the Jupiter character is portrayed as lazy and stupid and anti-intellectual. All he wants to do is run around and play and hunt and fish and get into mischief. And he can't understand why Jefferson wants to learn to read and to do scientific experiments and wonders about the movement of the earth and the stars and so forth. And so there's this interesting counterpoint that's going on. Jefferson, who's presented as everything that is good, and the slave boy, who's presented as everything that is sort of trite and trivial. And this embarrassed me. But it embarrassed me because I knew that my classmates would be reading this and that they would make the association with themselves, with Jefferson, of course, because they were white. And I, on the other hand, would be the black person. And this was supposed to be the essence of what black people were like. And I remember being outraged by that and thinking, even then, why can't they tell this story <laughs> or tell the story of Jefferson without having to say bad things about black people? Just tell the story. Despite my discomfort with this, I like the idea of reading about slavery, about this institution. It awakened an interest in history for me. Uh, I had a sense that, I mean, I knew obviously that there was more to it than was being presented in this book, but that was really the beginning of my interest in Jefferson and the interest in the institution of slavery. And so that's how I came and was very, very excited when I found my parents' book, Quite Over Black, by Winthrop Jordan, and he does have the chapter in there called Thomas Jefferson Self in Society. And it talks about Jefferson's relationship with black people, his attitude towards black people, and his attitudes about the institution of slavery. And that was sort of the real, really the first grown-up treatment of Jefferson that I had ever encountered. I'd sort of continued my interest in reading about slavery in Monticello by reading other biographies that I found in my school. And as I said, most of those were geared towards young people, and they really didn't grapple with, with issues in the way that I think that history books now are beginning to grapple with the issue of slavery. And I'll talk about that a little bit later, how classrooms are beginning to incorporate some of, some of my work and some of the works of other people on this particular topic. But at that time, it was out of the question for, for age-appropriate material about slavery and, and Jefferson. So I read this chapter, and that was my introduction to the Sally Hemings story. And what fascinated me about it was not so much the notion that Jefferson could have been involved with Sally Hemings, because if you grow up in the South, um, Texas, we were talking about the differences between Texas and the real deep South, but places where people had cotton and black people you know, picked cotton as slaves, there's a southern element to it. They were in the Confederacy. There's a western tinge to it. But when you grow up in that kind of environment, you know that slave masters had children by slave women. I mean, it's not anything that you think of as crazy. Um, and it's something that you think of as normal. It happened. If you go to a black family reunion, the people are all of the colors of the rainbow. In fact, the older people tend to be more fair than the younger people. Because in these little towns back there, that's what people did. If you put people together, they're going to mix. Whether you have laws or whatever telling them they're not supposed to, that is going to happen. And that's what happened in slavery. And it happened after slavery as well. So thinking about this as some sort of weird, strange thing just never, just never entered my mind. But what interested me about it was why, was the interest me about it was the plight of Madison Hemings, the children of Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. When I got the Fawn Brody book, she has, it's the first, as he said, the first biography that does a complete treatment of Jefferson's life and incorporates the story of Sally Hemings into his life. 
So she treats it as just a normal part of it. And of course, she was vilified for this. And I remember seeing her on the Today Show one morning and seeing her as this sort of embattled figure, because she was. People were furious at her for doing this. But at the back of the book, she has, she reprinted an interview that a man named Madison Hemings had done in 1873 with, Ohio, with an Ohio newspaper. And in this newspaper article, he talks about his life at Monticello, and he says that Thomas Jefferson was his father and Sally Hemings was his mother. She also reprinted an interview with a man named Israel Jefferson. His real name was Israel Gillette, but he took the name Jefferson after the end of slavery. And he was not a member of the Hemings family, but he grew up at Monticello, and he corroborates what Madison Hemings said about Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. And this was the first time these two memoirs had been printed in their entirety. Uh, people had quoted from them or had referred to them, but it was the first time they were put there in, in, in one place, all in, in their entirety. And what fascinated me about it was this notion of being the son of your master. What would it be like to think of your father as your father, but your father also owns you as a piece of chattel? Your father could sell you if he wanted to. Your father could leave you in slavery if he wanted to, and other people could sell you. Um, you were an expense, you were an item, you know, on, you were a tithable, you were things that were put down as part of his property. And what was it like to be in that, that situation? Sally Hemings and Thomas Jefferson interested me, but not the way it seems to interest other people. And I will get to that later on, this sort of continuing saga of Tom and Sally that will never die, um, much to my chagrin, but we'll get to that. But this notion of, of, of a family in slavery and this relationship to a family that owns you really fascinated me. Um, I got to Dartmouth College and I majored in history and I wanted to do my senior paper on this topic. And my professor, whom I adored, he was my favorite professor. I took lots of classes from him. He was a specialist in Southern history, particularly Native American history. But um, I told him what I wanted to do, and he said, Annette, I think you could do better than that. Um, that was just a story that was told by abolitionists, um, that was sort of invented by abolitionists to make you know, Jefferson look bad. Um, and I just don't think it would be worth your while. Well, I was trying to get into the law school of my choice at this time, and so when the professor told me it was not going to be worthwhile, I said, forget about it because I wasn't going to do a paper and have him say, hey, this is not worthwhile and give me a bad grade. So I went on to do a paper about black women and slavery. I took the WPA slave narratives and wrote up um, a story about the lives of women in slavery uh, from, their, from, their, um, from their memoirs. Didn't write the paper, and as I think about it, it was probably the best, one of the best things that ever happened to me because if I'd written it, I may have gotten it out of my system uh, and that there would have been no book because I would have done what, said what I wanted to say. So in any event, instead of going to graduate school to pursue my interest in history, um, this was the 80s, and everybody said, that's impractical, you know, you want to make some money, you should go to law school. I guess everybody says that. People say it now, thank God, as I say, as a professor of law. Yes, come on, any of you want to come? Um, the more the merrier. Um, and I went to law school thinking, if you love history, you can always read history. You can always read and write history if you want to. And if, it, if it's really something that's part of you, you will keep doing it. And I did keep doing it. I sort of had my eccentric interest in reading about Monticello and slavery. And anytime there was a new Jefferson biography or something written, you know, I'd turn to the index and say, well, let's see what they have to say about Sally Hemings. And, and then I sort of kept up with this over the years. And in 1995, I picked up a newspaper and I saw that they were going to be doing a movie called Jefferson in Paris. And this was before, I think it's even before they started to shoot the film. People were coming out of the woodwork saying, you know, this is a terrible, terrible thing. And the terrible thing is that they were going to write or do the movie as if Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings had actually had a relationship. And people were aghast at this. I remember there was a piece in Newsweek um, by a famous historian who doesn't even write in this field, saying, you know, 
you should not believe this. This is really terrible. Isn't it awful? There's no evidence. Jefferson wouldn't be involved with the slave girl. And I started to think, all of the sort of feelings that I had had over the years in reading this and having people treat this story, again, me from the perspective of a southerner, black person, knowing that miscegenation, interracial sex, interracial unions existed during slavery, not thinking it was terribly controversial, and then reading this and having people sound as if this was some story from you know, another planet. I'd always had that feeling at this particular moment, it crystallized with me, well, maybe you should do something about this. I was especially angered by how people discussed it. How people would say, there is no evidence that Jefferson was involved with Sally Hemings. And I knew about Madison Hemings' memoir and Israel Jefferson. And as a law professor, I, I would make the distinction, and I do in the book, evidence does not amount to proof, but evidence is a category. If you might have enough evidence to amount to proof, but they're not the same thing. To say that every bit of evidence has to itself amount to proof is a way of denying. It's a way of not dealing with, with situations. And so even if people didn't believe Madison Hemings, to say that there was no evidence was a way of making him and the term, to coin a phrase, well, I, won't, I won't take credit for this obviously, the invisible man. He's the invisible man. As if he never spoke, Madison Hemings and Israel Jefferson. No evidence that this existed. Um, don't, again, you don't have to believe it, but to say that it doesn't exist is a way of making them not exist, is to shut them up without listening to what they had to say. The other thing that bothered me is people would say, well, Jefferson would never be involved with a slave girl. And just the phrase, a slave girl. Well, what is a slave girl? Who is a slave girl? Millions of African American women throughout history, a slave girl, reduced to that phrase is if you knew everything you needed to know about Sally Hemings, who she was, what she was like, her personality. History is an imaginative enterprise. You know, that when you imagine who this person is, Everybody would know what you're saying when you say a slave girl. What, what do most people think of? Most people in America probably think gone with the wind. A slave girl is prissy. A slave girl is mammy. A slave girl is someone who is subhuman and is not capable of attracting or capable of being involved with someone as elevated as Thomas Jefferson. He would never be involved with a slave girl. And I was offended by that because I thought it took away Sally Hemings' humanity. Now, we don't know a lot about Sally Hemings, but there are things that are known about her. And to deal with her and to dismiss her in that phrase, a slave girl, I thought, was a racist way of dealing with it. And these are not people, I'm not saying that these were people who, all of them, <laughs> would say, you know, you know, I hate black people. I want to do mean things to black people. I want to hurt black people. No, these are people who, are, who have a habit of mind that has existed for them all of their lives, and they do things in a lot of ways in an unthinking fashion. What are you saying that he would not be involved with the slave girl when you don't tell me who this slave girl was? So I sat down in the New York Public Library in the reading room, the beautiful reading room. It's the, I want, when I die, I want to go to <laughs> the stacks of the New York Public Library and have my run of the reading room. Um, that would be my idea of heaven. Um, so I went to the reading room and I sat down to write an op-ed piece. And the op-ed piece got longer and longer. And while I was sitting there, if you go to the reading room, they have books along the sides. And they have a section of biography and they actually have a section of the biographies of presidents. And so I went over and looked at the Jefferson one, and I happened to pull out one that I hadn't seen before. And it was a book called Thomas Jefferson, A Life. It's a huge book. Uh, Henry Holt, I think, published it. And by a man named Willard Stern Randall. And so I did my usual, well, let's see what they have to say about Sally Hemings and Madison Hemings. So I looked in the index, and when I went to the pages, there was one passage when he's talking about Madison Hemings' memoirs, and he says, he refers to Madison Hemings as, well, he basically says, well, who are you going to believe about this? You know, these eminent historians or this would-be former house slave. And I thought, 
would be, what is a would be former house slave? <laughs> what is that? It's like a, it's a, it was a, it's an epithet. I mean, and I looked, I turned to look at the front of the book, to look at the copyright. This is 1990s. Somebody is writing like this about someone. And I, I mean, this is one of these moments where when you say you, you think you're going to have a stroke, I thought I was going to have a stroke. I, I could feel my blood pressure rising. The top of my, I thought the top of my head was going to come off. And I said, you know, this, this cannot go on. Um, and so this op-ed piece, as I said, that was already getting longer than it, it would have, anybody would ever print it, became a book. Because I said, well, what's the use of having this eccentric interest in this if you don't use it, you don't put it to some purpose? So I sat down, and I didn't tell anybody I was writing a book except my husband. I didn't tell them at my school. I would just kind of show up at odd hours. I mean, I worked on that book, and I would never do this again. And I, I don't even recognize that person. It's one of the things that I look back on it now, and I think, what was that about? I mean, <laughs> who was that? I really, I can't, maybe someday I'll be able to tap into that again, or I'm not so sure I want to. Um, but I worked on that book seven days a week, 15, 16, 17 hours a day. I mean, I would leave my office at 3 o'clock in the morning in downtown Manhattan and walk home at night. <laughs> and I'm thinking, what, what were you doing? You know, walking through these dark streets and sort of, and I'd wake up some mornings almost in mid-sentence that this was like an obsession that I just went through. And I, as I said, my husband who bore this, you know, with great, you know, <laughs> aplomb, I must say. I mean, he probably thought, this woman is crazy. She's gone crazy on me. But I was working as if there was a deadline. And of course there was no deadline because I had no publisher. <laughs> right? <laughs> I had no publisher. I had no sense that anybody was going to publish this. I thought it was good, but I didn't care. I mean, it was something that I really just had to do. And... Um, during the course of it, I had the, and I worked at the New York Public Library. Um, I took my own money and went down to Virginia. I mean, I exhausted my research budget uh, at my school. Of course, I, as then, I didn't tell them what I was doing. I was just sort of going down to Virginia and at Alderman Library and at Petersburg, Virginia and in Richmond and, you know, staying in these nice hotels <laughs> and doing these kinds of things and just working like a dog for um, a solid, four or five months of research and writing, as I, even researching as I was writing. And I got a draft, and I decided that what I had to do was to talk to people who knew a lot about slavery at Monticello. So I went down to, Mon to Monticello and talked to a woman named Cinder Stanton, who, is, who knows more about Thomas Jefferson, who's forgotten more about Thomas Jefferson than I'll ever know, and that other people will learn. She's devoted her life to this. And we sat down in her office, and I went through my manuscript with her, and I asked her questions, and it started a process that we call 60 questions. Whenever I would always call her up and say, now what about this, what about that? Because I knew that I had to go to sort of in the belly of the beast. These were the people who were seen as the keepers of the flame. And I wanted to hear what they had to say before I published the book. And the idea was, look, if there's any problem with this, I want you to tell me now. Don't wait until this book is published to come out and say, well, you didn't think of this, or you didn't think of that, or you didn't think of the other thing. And to my surprise, they were much more open to this than I had imagined they would be. Because what's going on at Monticello, uh, or what was going on then, and it's been accelerated now, is a process of realizing that Jefferson lived at Monticello but hundreds of other black people were enslaved at Monticello, and they matter too. And for the most part, if you, up until recently, if you ever visited Monticello, and the first time I went there was when I was working on the book, it was a story about the house, and oh, this is Jefferson's gadgets, and oh, and you know, here's the, the clock, you know, and here's the, the woolly mammoth tooth, or all, you know, all these kinds of things are about him, and not about the people who actually built Monticello. If you walk in, the floors, were done by John Hemings. The ceilings, all of those things were built by, largely by black workmen, either under their own creativity or either under the direction of some of the few white workmen that Jefferson had at Monticello. And so there's been a process of making 
this place that a lot of black people don't want to visit. I mean, I was on television once and someone asked, well, you know, why would black people want to go to visit a plantation? And that's a good question. Maybe we can talk about that later on. But, I mean, for me, it's, I wanted to visit it and I've been interested in this story about Jefferson, but mainly because Monticello is a place where most people get their introduction to slavery. You know, high school students are trucked up there and, you know, pull through there. And I wanted to make sure that when they tell the story of life at Monticello, they tell the story not just of white people, they tell the story of black people as well. And that's a crucial thing that has to be done. So this process was beginning when I got down there with my manuscript, and I've made some really lifelong friends in working on this, pro working in, on this project. Um, one person that I met was a man named Peter Onuf, who was the chairman of the history department at UVA. And I had read some of the things that he'd said about the Hemings story, and so I wanted to send him the manuscript and have him read it and tell me why I was wrong. Now, unlike most of the people who reacted harshly to the, to the notion that Jefferson had a relationship with Sally Hemings, the earlier historians were upset because they said, you know, Jefferson was a Southern gentleman, and a Southern gentleman would never do anything like this. <laughs> so that, that was the idea. Peter, the younger generation of historians said, Jefferson is too racist. It wasn't, they didn't buy this Jefferson as a Southern gentleman thing. It's that no, a man as racist as Jefferson would not have had sex with and children with Sally Hemings. And neither of those, as, I, as you probably guessed, neither of those arguments moved me, but I knew that he was very um, ser sincere about this, so I sent him the manuscript, and he read it, and he liked it. And he was the person who suggested that the University Press of Virginia publish the book. And um, so that's how I got a publisher. And they were very excited to do it. And they saw it as sort of a, um, a breakthrough sort of crossover book for them because they knew anything that has Jefferson on it sells. You can have Jefferson and bread, Jefferson and dirt, <laughs> Jefferson and whatever. You try to get that name in the title and people are going to buy it. I mean, it's just a fact. People now are trying to make John Adams you know, the, the hero, I mean, it's, it's not going to work. Because John Adams, I mean, there's nothing to John Adams but politics. There's no gardens, there's no, you know, slave mistresses, no, you know, nothing like that, just politics. But Jefferson, the, the number one question they get at Monticello about Jefferson is about Jefferson and cooking. Not about politics or anything like that. So here's somebody who has a vast um, an, amount of subjects, of ways into him. And so therefore, I mean, I know that he's this figure that is always going to be there, and it's, an, it's a way to sort of teach some very, very valuable lessons by talking about his life. And so the University Press of Virginia publishes the book, and it does very, very well. And to my surprise, I get really, really good reviews. And in fact, everybody reviews it because everybody's interested in this topic. And this is something else we can talk about is why. I mean, that's the part that Winthrop Jordan in his book, if you, you should really read it, White Over Black, is the seminal book on slavery in, in the United States. It's one of the seminal books on slavery in the United States. And what he says, and what he said recently, is why do people care so much about this? You know, when any time somebody writes about Jefferson and Hemings in the New York Times, you know, I have, a per I have a friend who works there, and he says, I get volumes of mail. People, it's just a visceral thing that people have about this. And what interested me from the beginning was, as I said, how people talked about it, why people felt it was necessary to debunk this story in such strong terms. So the book is published, it does well, I get good reviews, and I'm down in Charlottesville giving a talk, much like this, at, the, um, at a Baptist church, the oldest black Baptist church in Charlottesville, started by um, freed slaves um, in the 1850s. And a woman raises her hand and she says, well, we're talking about this now, but we're going to have an answer to this pretty soon. And I said, how are you going to do that? And she said, we're going to do a DNA test. And I found out later that they really didn't know how they were going to do this at the time. They were just sort of positing that they were going to do a DNA test. Well, I had posited that. I mean, I knew that eventually something like this was going to happen. There have been all kinds of proposals to show you how really, really out there this gets of digging Jefferson up and testing him, I mean, it's really, I mean, the lengths that people think that you have to go in order to prove this are really, really amazing to me. 
But she said, we're going to have a DNA test. And sure enough, they figured out, I think two months later, a biochemist at UVA told them how they might be able to do this, uh, to do a DNA test. And what they decided to do was to test some descendants from Jefferson's family, from the Hemings family, from a family called the Cars. I should back up and tell you, I'm talking about this as if people know what the story is. Um, there was a counter story to the Jefferson and Hemings story that was told by Jefferson's family. Jefferson's grandchildren said, well, the reason all of Sally Hemings' children look like Thomas Jefferson <laughs> is because, it's not because they're his children, but they are the children of his nephews, Peter Carr and Samuel Carr. And that was the story for 150 years. Um, they're his kids, and that's why, and that's a, you know, a plausible story. I mean, it's possible for somebody to look like, you know, their uncle or cousins and so forth. I mean, it's not, it's not out there. Um, but I, you know, I talk about this in the book, and I sort of try to explain why it doesn't make sense. But it's a plausible story. So what they had to do when they did the DNA test, and I can explain what happens, is that they took male line descendants from the Jefferson family, male line descendants from the Hemings family, male line descendants from the Carr family, and male line descendants from a family called the Woodsons, who believe that they are descended from Jefferson as well. And this works because in all males, you know, we just, this biology 101, and I'm the worst person to do this, but <laughs> males have XY chromosomes. On the Y chromosome is, the Y chromosome does not recombine. So the Y chromosome in every male in this room looks, your father's looks exactly like yours. If you have a son, it will look like, look like yours. Down the generations, it will look the same. And so what you're able to do, and you're able to establish, there is a car line of, D of male DNA. There is a Jefferson line of DNA. There is a Hemings line of DNA. So they took descendants from these various families, drew blood from them. I think there were 20 of them, totally, of men, different categories. He wouldn't take fathers and sons because he didn't want anybody to find out any unfortunate information. Actually, there was one person who turned out to be not related to anybody in there, so there was an illegitimacy in in the family that people didn't know about. In other words, someone thought his father was his father, but he was not. Uh, and so they found out. Um, so they took this blood, sent it to Europe among three labs, one at Oxford, I think one in Belgium, and one in another country. I'm, I'm losing this. But they all tested the Y chromosome from different methodologies, three different labs. The results came back, and they were all the same from all three labs. The Hemings and the Jefferson Y chromosome were exactly the same. The car was somebody totally different, not at, in the family at all, and the Woodsons not in the family at all. Now the interesting thing about this is that my book says this, and I think the, the thing that I take the most satisfaction of and is a person who is sort of an enlightenment throwback. I mean, I actually believe in reason and facts and things like that, that before you had this scientific test, it was clear there wasn't going to be a Carr connection, there wasn't going to be a Woodson connection, and there was going to be a Hemings and Jefferson connection. Just by looking at documents and information and reasonable inferences, you can draw these conclusions. And so this was announced November 1st, 1998. Um, I'd gotten a call. I'd been, this, you know, she said that they were going to do this. They, it took a year to do the test, so I was like a lawyer in this case, sitting around waiting for the jury to come back in. I'm saying, oh gosh, you know, I know it's not the cars, but please don't let it be the cars, because I'm going to look like a fool if it's the cars. <laughs> because I've said it can't be them. And it's one of the few times in history where you actually have something that you say can be tested. So I was sitting there for a year waiting for this to happen. And I got a phone call, I think about October 20, 25th, from a friend of mine at Columbia. And he said, well, first I got a phone call from US News and World Report. And there's this reporter who said, Professor Gordon Reed, what would you say if the DNA came back and there was a connection between the Hemingses and the cars? And then I said, well, I would say this. Well, what would you say? It was one of these, you know, what if things. And I didn't think anything about it. I was cooking dinner. It was the, and I said, oh, okay, sure. And I hang up the phone. The next day, I get a call from my friend at Columbia who said, 
the test results are back, and do you know what they are? And I said, no, and he's told me that there is a connection between the Hemings and the Jeffersons, there's no connection between the Cars, and there's no connection between the Woodsons. And that afternoon, I started getting calls from newspapers all over the country. They had, they had gotten the test results back, and they knew what was going to happen, and they had decided to embargo the story because they wanted it to break on the following Sunday, on the coming Sunday. So from Tuesday until the Sunday, I was doing a lot of interviews with people, and they kept it. I mean, you think that newspapers, as soon as they find things out, they go out and print it. No, everybody, the Times, the LA Times, the London Times, papers everywhere knew this for about a week and kept it until Sunday. So they could put it up in the Sunday morning paper, there it is on the front page. And um, although one, the Seattle, I think the Seattle paper carried it in its late edition Saturday night. <laughs> it was the one p person that broke the embargo. And so this was printed and, you know, as you can imagine, everything just went crazy because um, and it was deceptive because the, the test, as I described it, is not a strict paternity test. It doesn't say Jefferson was the father of all of these children. But what happens after this is that what people say is, look, it isn't just the science, it's the documentary evidence, it's all the things together that point to this particular conclusion. So the tests come out, and as we said before, my life sort of changes at this point, and Monticello has to decide what they're gonna do. The Thomas Jefferson Foundation, which is the organization that runs the house, you know, runs the museum that is Monticello, and they have to decide what they're gonna say because they have all these visitors, hundreds of thousands of visitors that come, and they all ask about Tom and Sally. I mean, I actually went on one of the tours. This is before anybody who knew, knew who I was, and <clears throat> I didn't raise the question, but people do raise the question, well, what about this Sally Hemings thing? So they had to figure out what they are going to do. Well, they couldn't just on the basis of the DNA or just on the basis of my book say, all right, here's what we're going to say. So they did their own study, and they came out with their own report, and they conclude that the story is true, and they are now in the process of trying to incorporate this, and I say trying to incorporate this into the tours because there are some tour guides who are very recalcitrant. Yeah. These, are, these, are volunteer, these are volunteers, a lot of them are older Virginian people, and this is just, I mean, you know, they're not having it. And they, so, depend, so right now, depending upon who gives you the tour, you get a different story about what has happened here. And so they're working on that and trying to find some way um, to, um, to deal with this. Now in the meantime, about a week after, uh, maybe not even a week after the DNA t tests were, were announced, I got an email from a man named Herbert Barger who said, well, this test doesn't prove that it's Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson had a brother and his name is Randolph. And Randolph fathered these children. Now, Randolph has not appeared anywhere until November 1st, 1998. There is no documentary connection to Sally Hemings, to Randolph. And you remember the family story was that it was the cars. And you remember with the DNA, everybody has their own, you know, individual DNA line. And so the family story as told by a small group of people flipped overnight. First it was obvious that it was the cars after the DNA, it's obvious that it was Randolph. So that has now emerged, it, when I keep saying the sort of continuing saga of Tom and Sally, that has emerged as the thing that people are gonna fight about now. It was Randolph, even though there's nothing in the record that suggests this. Randolph has just been sort of brought up here after the DNA. So this group, he got together a group of people and they called themselves the Scholars Commission. And it's another battle. This is, I can't believe that there's no writer about culture who has not covered this because it is a fascinating story about American culture. I mean, this is seen now as an item in the culture wars. He, what they did was they enlisted a number of conservative scholars. Now, I mean, this is not a conservative liberal issue. 
I mean, to, it, it really is not. I mean, he, he was the father of these kids or he was not. It's not about whether you're a Republican or a Democrat or anything, but somehow people have come to view this, and I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that I'm black. In one of the books that was written after this, many pamphlets, I'm always referred to as the Negro writer. The Negro writer, Annette Gordon-Reed says, the Negro writer says, you know, it, you know, it's really, really amazing stuff. <laughs> you know, just bizarre kind of things. And, and I, I mean, you don't have to believe this story. I don't particularly care whether people believe the story, whether he did or did not. I wrote the book because I thought that the evidence that was presented on the other side was being, was being given short shrift and people were talking about folks in a way that was insulting. Essentially, that's what my, my goal was. And so this has emerged as an item of the culture wars. Um, who, Mansfield, Harvey Mansfield at Harvard, um, a historian named Forrest McDonald, a number of people, uh, an economist named Walter Williams, he's a black economist, he's on television quite a bit. What they know about Monticello is, <laughs> I mean, you couldn't, I mean, now M Mansfield has written about the political philosophy of Jefferson, but knowing about the political thought of someone is not the same as knowing about the institution of slavery. There's a body of scholarship about that, people who are scholars in slavery, and nobody on that commission is in, is in that category, none of them, none of them. And so what happened was they decided to get this commission together, Barger and the Thomas Jefferson Heritage Foundation, which was founded by one of Jefferson's white descendants who has, was the most vocal opponent of the cemetery thing, which we, I'm sure some of you have heard of, whether or not the Hemingses get to be buried in the cemetery. Another thing that I don't, I don't say I don't care about, I mean, I care about everything, but this isn't you know, my issue. Um, he was a vocal opponent of that, and as a part of his campaign not to have them buried in the cemetery, even though most of them don't want, nobody, I don't know any Hemings person who wants to be buried at Monticello. Um, he, he was the one who sponsored the uh, Scholars Commission, and as I said, it was written by one guy who was, uh, who was a professor of law at UVA, and these other scholars kind of just said, me too. They kind of signed on to it. It's, it's an amazing, I, I just can't get over this notion of, of a commission. You think of the Warren Commission, you think of the Iran Contra, but the, the Scholars Commission about Tom and Sally is just, <laughs> is from people who don't even, this isn't even their field, but it's, and we can think about that, and maybe some of your questions, we can explore this in the discussion phase. You know, what is it about this topic that makes people so unhinged in a way. I mean, you know, either one way or the other, just the kind of passion that it drives. And some people say it's because it's Jefferson, and he is sort of seen by some people as the personification of America. And if you say something bad about Jefferson, and people see this as being bad about Jefferson, then you are attacking in America. But, I mean, the thing that I've always, when people talk to me about the Hemming story and, and categorize this as bad, but, you know, Jefferson was a slave owner. I mean, there's a, a letter from Jefferson um, to his overseer at Poplar Forest, one of his plantations. It's about 1815. And he's negotiating with this guy about the sale of a three-year-old girl. Now, he doesn't go through with it. He backs out from it. But there are these series of correspondence. And, and Cinder and I are thinking, you know, we're trying to make something out of this. We're thinking, you know, what could this be about? I mean, why, I mean, why would you do this? To think of, you know, children didn't amount to much. I mean, you bought a three-year-old. You'd have to take care of it. It's not a productive. I mean, what, I mean what is he, what's going on here? And it was seen as a bad thing to sell children away from their mothers. I mean, we would think that. But how could a person who could think about, even though he doesn't go through with it, think about selling a three-year-old from their mother, be okay, but somebody who has sex with for 38 years with a woman, has six children, frees all of them and her, she's freed by his daughter afterwards, that's the worst thing that he ever did. But he can buy and sell people and folks don't see that as making him bad. I mean, to me, again, this, this story is fascinating because it's not it's about Jefferson and Hemings, but it reveals so much about people's values, just in the way they talk about it. I mean, there are a lot more problems with Jefferson as a person than Sally Hemings. 
you know, I mean, I, I, I think that now, and I don't want to minimize this because the other side of it is, and what's, what's moving from, we're moving from talking about it as a racial topic now as a, as an, as a gender issue. Because how can you talk about a relationship? What do you even call this? How do you talk about a relationship between a person who is a slave and a master? Because there's always the issue of consent. If someone can't say no to you, can that person be in what you would call a relationship? So there's a lot of, there are a lot of dimensions to all of this. But the main point um, that, that, I, that I've been trying to make with a lot of these people who've been very, very critical of me. Um, strangely enough, really until after, after the DNA, after the Monticello report came out and they decided that they were going to accept this, I became sort of the focus of their ire. Uh, they had left me alone pretty much before then. But now I think the people who are, is this, and it's a tiny group of people, I don't want to exaggerate this, most people don't care, right? But the people who really, really care have sort of focused their ire on me because they see me as someone who sort of put this in motion. And I'm, you know, in someone's words, I'm the, the antichrist. <laughs> you know, I mean, and Peter Onuf is the evil genius. These are quotes. I mean, people, the evil genius and the antichrist, you know, um, about this topic. Um, so this is a long way from the third grade <laughs> is the point. Um, you know, to come to something like this, uh, it's, I'm going to have to write my memoirs. And of course, I don't even get into Vernon Jordan at this point. Um, we're all in, in the middle of all of this. I get a call from, from Vernon Jordan who says, well, you know, I'm Vernon Jordan. I'm a lawyer in Washington. And, you know, he invites me to lunch and says that he wants me to help him write his memoirs. And I said, sure. And of course, in the middle of all of this, we've got Monica. So we have Monica and Tom and Sally and all of this gets mixed up together. <laughs> No, you remember that. People were saying, well, you know, this is, Bill Clinton has done bad things, and Thomas Jefferson did bad things, and so it's okay. I mean, and I'm sitting here thinking, you know, like, feel like Zelik. How did I get into this? <laughs> All of these people, everything sort of coalesces around this, this one topic. Um, it's been an amazing ride for me, um, and I was mentioning before, I've always written. In addition to being interested in history, I started out writing short stories as a kid and have a collection of bad short stories that maybe now I can pull out and maybe somebody will publish them since they've actually, <laughs> actually heard of me. Uh, but it's, it's been one of, I think I'm one of the luckiest people in the world to get a chance to do something that I've been thinking about and something I've been caring about since I was a child. I often say it's like being a, a baseball player. People grow up doing Little League and then all of a sudden they get to be on a professional team and play. And, and I really feel that that's, that's sort of what has happened to me. And anything else that happens from now on is, is pretty, much, pretty much gravy. I, to get a chance to, as I said, do something that you're passionate about and actually accomplish what I set out to do. I really wanted nothing more than to change the way people thought about this topic, hoping that it would change the way people view slave narratives and oral history and the words of black people, that people will look at that differently now um, because of the way this subject has been treated. And no matter what happens in the future, I think I, I've been able to do that, and I've had fun uh, while I did it. So now I'd like to take any questions that you might have. Um, I was really happy you made the comment about what's going on at Monticello because I was there right after they made the announcement and I had a very old Virginian gentleman who refused to even acknowledge that someone had asked a question about it. He mm -hmm. just kept talking and, <laughs> and, and would not even acknowledge uh -huh. that it was a topic. And I was, I was very troubled by that because you'd think you'd go to the source, Monticello, and possibly hear some enlightening information. So I'm actually anxious to go back in another couple of years and see if they're actually going to change what they communicate about it. Yeah, I, I hear mixed things. I mean, I try, I've tried to go on the tour. Everybody knows who I am there. And so when I go on the tour, it's like, you know, well, of course. I mean, you know, and, and they do this thing. And, and you know that it's, I, I can't make myself invisible and really hear what it is that they're saying. But I, the reports that I get is that it's mixed. 
you know, there's some people who, I'm, I'm a little surprised to hear that the person didn't acknowledge it at all, but it usually is that people, you know, say that this is not likely true or, you know, and they, they go off the script. They wander off, you know, you know, off the plan. Um, they're, they're really grappling with it, and I, and I really, I think that Dan Jordan, Dan Jordan is the head of the Thomas Jefferson Foundation, who is, when I first went down there, I went down two or three times before I even met Dan. Now, I, I don't know whether he was avoiding me or whatever, but this whole topic made him very, very uncomfortable. When I, when I had my manuscript and I was going down to try to get more information about it. But I have to say, he's been amazing and been under a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure. People, you know, trying to get donors not to give money, uh, people trying to get him fired. And he has stood up to a lot of pressure to say, look, the best available information that we have now, and that's all history is. It's the best available information we have now is that this is what happened. And he is taking a lot, a lot of heat from that. And he's, and the, the funny thing is, and everybody, remember I told you that this is an item of the culture war. Some people say, oh, this is all about political correctness. Dan is, is you know, is, is this Mississippi moderate guy. I mean, he's not some wild-eyed radical. And he's being portrayed as, he's like Che Guevara or somebody. <laughs> and, you know, it's just the funniest thing. I mean, from my perspective, he's, well, I mean, he's not right wing, but he's, you know, he's a, he's a conservative guy. Conservative in his temperament, conservative in, and he would wish, I know all this stuff was not even here. He would prefer, but he has stood up like, you know, like a real man and person, human being, and done what is right. And he's, he is really quite embattled at this point. Although I must say, there, but there are other people from the other side who are very, very supportive of him. But usually it's when you have the small group of people who see this as a matter of life and death, and they really do, um, who are sort of making life difficult for him. And they're trying to do the best they can. I just have a quick question. Um, now that you're done with the, the Jefferson, what's, what's, are you passionate? What subject is, uh, lighting your fire now that are you uh, is something really in sticking out in your mind uh, historically that you're looking at well what I'm doing now is I'm, I'm doing a biography of the Hemings family which is really an excuse to write about slavery to do sort of a general history academics don't like this but a popular history a, a an accessible history of of slavery in 18th century Virginia and to sort of use them as a backdrop of telling this particular story. And does it have the passion for me? I have to be honest with you, no. Because, I mean, it doesn't have, I mean, interested in it, but it's not the, I'm not, I'll tell you, I'm not working on this 18 hours a day, <laughs> seven days a week, you know, in uh, my publisher, there's no one representative here, they're probably glad to, wouldn't want to hear that. But that's, <laughs> that's what interests me right now is to try to, I mean, the slavery, back to this question of why does anybody go to a plantation, and when people have asked me that is, I mean, I feel so, um, I teach a class called Slavery and the Law, and I read these cases, and when you read about individual, the lives of individual slaves, I am so humbled and so, well, I feel a lot of things, anger, sadness, awe, at what people went through, what they suffered and endured. And I really think that the only way that I can, you know, you can't make that right. I can't go back and undo that. But what I can try to do now is to use whatever skill I have to make their stories come alive and live. And I mean, that was, as I said, what so frustrated me about Madison Hemings, not whether he was the father, his father, I mean, that's interesting, but the notion that somebody comes out of slavery and tells you what happened, and people say, I don't want to hear that because I don't like what you're saying, it's just, and when it doesn't happen to anybody else, for example, people come out of Russia, the gulag, and say, these were my experiences, and they get the Nobel Prize or they're treated with respect. And when slaves, American slaves come out and say, this is what happened, depending, if they're saying that it wasn't so bad, ah, that's right. But if you're saying, this is something that happened to me, 
um, that is not palatable to people is kind of slapped down. So that's the passion that drives the work um, for me, is to try to not right or wrong, because I'll never do that, but to sort of repay people for not giving up. Um, first of all, I just wanted to thank you for coming and giving this talk. And um, say, just from my perspective as a black American, thank you so much for pursuing this topic um, mm -hmm. in the way you have. And it's quite clear from you, your academic background, your credentials, your whole presentation, you are the perfect person to have pursued this. So well, thank you. Thanks for having the courage to do it. Um, and I just wanted to uh, follow up more about this whole issue of denial that you've been talking about. And I mean, obviously, denial is a powerful variable in a lot of different settings. Um, because in order to break through it, it means you have to reorder your view of reality. But I'm just very curious in, in, in the conversations that you've had with some of the people that are so dogged in their disbelief of this, mm -hmm. what is at stake for them? What, it's just, it's Jefferson. I mean, I, we're not saying, you're not saying, you know, this means if you accept this, that slavery was a bad thing. You're mm -hmm. not even saying that. You're saying he had some kids with a slave. What is at stake for these people in accepting this information? Um, well, what's at stake? And I've asked myself that a million times. Well, I do this all the time. What's at stake? There are different things at stake. I think whiteness is at stake. Oh, well, that explains it. Well, no, I mean, I mean for, for people who just refuse and, and are angered by it and hostile, I mean, I'm not saying you don't, there are people who could say, well, look at this, and say, it's not enough for me. But the kind of, you mean people who bring the kind of anger and hostility about it, it's Jefferson is seen as the personification of America to some people. He is, there's a famous quote from a historian, if Jefferson is right, America is right. If Jefferson is wrong, America is wrong. As the architect of the Declaration of Independence, the sort of guiding spirit of what America is supposed to be about. And I think for some people, people see, if you see the country as a white country, and black people as sort of the other, this story makes clear that black people are not the other. I mean, we've always been here, and the sort of, sort of a blood-based notion of who is an American, that is to say, blood-based blood -based and white, this mixes that up. If he had children with her, then a founding father has children who are black. And I think that that upsets people on one level. I think something else is at stake for people who, who feel on the, on the gender question that you're calling Jefferson a rapist. You know, you're saying he's a rapist. Now, back to what I said before, um, he was a slaveholder and he bought and sold people and there are all kinds of things that you could sort of, you know, hang your hat on and saying, well, this, re this is a reason I'm not going to admire this person. There are people who really feel that by accepting this, you're saying bad things about someone who stands for the country and doesn't explain why they are willing to accept all the other <laughs> things about him. Uh, I mean, I have some theories about that as well. I mean, I really think that, you know, when I, when I read this question about him selling people, I think that this is seen as something that is not only, it's a betrayal of white people. When he's doing things that hurt black people alone, that's not much of a concern. But if he has children with Hemings, he had two white daughters who would have been old enough, were old enough, the same age as Sally, one of them exactly the same age, and one younger, and they had children, it's seen as an intrusion onto this, to this white family. And he is in some ways a race traitor. There's a book 
uh, by a woman who, she was, she was encouraged to write this book by one of the historians that I write about, a man named Alf Mapp. And it's a book about Jefferson and his wife who died um, when he was 38 years old. And it's called My Thomas. And it's clear that this book is a way of, of sort of reclaiming him into bringing him back into whiteness. And Sally, Sally was a little girl when Martha died. Sally was about seven or eight years old. So even in this book, she is portrayed as, as seven and eight as this sort of manipulative, she's portrayed in a negative way, unnecessarily, right? You know, I mean, there, there she's sort of hitting, you know, this little girl who's seven or eight years old. And I think a lot of it is a way of trying to reclaim him and bring him back into the fold. So this is a long answer except to say that I think that there's a racial dimension to it as to who this country, who, what amounts to being an American. And if you have a founding father who has black children, you can't claim America solely for white people. Now, I don't think that that's, that calculus doesn't make any sense to me, but in the way people talk about it, I, I did a talk at Richmond and there was a member of the Klan, there were a couple of members of the Klan there, and one of them got up and he was screaming at me about notes on the state of Virginia. And it's uh, notes on the state of Virginia is the only, well, well, the only book that Jefferson published, wrote and published. I think there was, a, there was another one, but it doesn't count. Um, the only sort of narrative book that he, that he wrote and published. And in it, he talks about black people. He says some really terrible things about black people, very, very racist things. And this Klansman, who evidently likes notes on the state of Virginia, <laughs> was standing up and yelling at me about, well, you know, didn't you read this book? I know you're a professor. Haven't you read this book? He would never be for race mixing, and this would be race mixing. There's a, there's a genetic sort of blood insanity. insanity that's involved in some people. It's not just hey, I don't believe this, it's, you know, we're, this is, a, this is a race question, and he is on our side racially, and people really see it that way. I don't know whether any of your research could have revealed uh, the, uh, some information on the thought that I have, but I was thinking that one of the most repugnant things from, a, from the perspective of a, a racist white person might be the possibility that Jefferson was in love with her. And uh, in fact, uh, in his private times with her, which there must have been obviously, that he really cared very much about her. Now, I, I haven't read your book, so mm -hmm. it may be that what I'm saying is very naive mm -hmm. and not supported by any of the facts. Mm -hmm. uh, but nevertheless, I was wondering whether you gave any thought to the possibility that he had fallen in love with her uh, and that that was what their relationship was about, and that in the milieu that he lived in, uh, there was no way that he could reveal uh, that reality to anybody, uh, and so it was in, uh, completely hidden, but nevertheless, it was what drove their relationship. Even if initially he uh, had a sexual relationship with her, it quite possibly could have evolved uh, into a truly loving relationship. So I have you thought about that, and is it all possible? Well, I talk about it in the book, and, I, and that very question, and it's interesting you should put it that way, because the book is a series, it's sort of a mock Socratic <laughs> dialogue, and with what you do with, with, with law students. You know, it always puzzled me as to why people were so adamant that it was impossible. That's the other side of it, too. It's not only it was impossible that it happened, and if it did happen, it's impossible for him to have had any affection for her, which I find is an interesting thing. It's that people sort of, I mean, it's hard enough to know how people that you come into contact with on a day-to-day -day basis, why they're with the people they're with, you know, how, what they see in the people they're with. You know, to think of somebody that, you know, that lived 200 years ago, that you could make a pronouncement that it would be impossible for him to have felt a certain way about another person. It's just like a, I mean, it's breathtaking to me. It, it's true, maybe it was impossible, but I would never, how do you have the confidence to say that, you know, that it's impossible? Um, and I, I talk about this in the book, and we don't, re you'll never know what Sally Hemings thought about Thomas Jefferson or him about her because, it, well, there's some things you might infer from his actions, but, for, but from her perspective, because she can't say no, right, and because 
she didn't write anything about this. You don't know from her perspective. What I found interesting about this is that he was obviously attached to her for a very, very long period of time. They had children over a period of 20 years. And I, I think I say in the book, you know, you can, you know, lust lasts for 20 minutes, maybe 20 weeks, but not 20 years. I mean, I, I, I don't see how you have, and maybe this is a sexist thing, and men in the audience can correct me if it's the case, or, or women, it's, maybe it's not a sexist thing. I mean, if you said that a man had a purely sexual interest in, it was coming back to one woman for 20 years, and there's no other, no way, no way. And there's no other, I mean, there's no other talk about Jefferson and any other woman besides Sally for the rest of his life. I don't know what that's about. From, from her perspective, we don't know what she thought about him, but this is a guy who's a wealthy widower. You know all those women, and you could tell from the correspondence, women in that community were interested in him as they would be. I mean, a wealthy landowner um, was apparently an attractive, intelligent guy, but there's nobody that anybody talks about except Sally. Now, to me, that that's a clue that he was attached to her, whatever she may have felt about him. And I do think, and I, and I don't wonder if there's not a part of people who fear, actually, Duma Malone, who wrote who was the preeminent Jefferson biographer. He wrote six volumes. This man spent 41 years writing the biography of Thomas Jefferson. At the end of his life, and he was adamant that this never happened, at the end of his life, he gave an interview for the New York Times, and he says, well, you know, I could see him having sex with her once or twice, but I can't accept a 38-year relationship. And that goes to what you're saying here. Why is it better? Would it be better if he just had sex, with, if he was the kind of person who went around having sex with slaves, you know, once or twice, versus being in a 38-year relationship with one woman. Why, that was, Malone couldn't abide that. And I think it goes back to what I'm saying here before. It's like forming a family with someone. And that is a social faux pas. It's one thing to, you know, to go and have sex, but when you begin to act like this person is in like a common law, well, yeah, uh, I don't think any thought anybody was his equal, but certainly not somebody like that. But you know, but yeah, but like a like a relationship that is committed in a way that really unnerved him, and he couldn't take that. I mean, there's, and so, and I get, and people always when I say that, people say, "Well, you're saying that this was a great love affair," and, it's, and no, I'm just saying, I don't know. What do you describe it? Well, what is love? <laughs> what do you, what, I mean, what do you describe someone who is, I don't have any problem saying that Jefferson could have felt comfort or joy in Sally Hemings' presence and saying, you know, this is somebody that I like and whatever, but does it have to be, you know, there has to be something there for him, and I don't think that sex alone. The thing that I've left out is that everybody accepts, even without DNA, that Sally Hemings was Jefferson's wife's half-sister. So, I mean, in this convoluted family history here, his wife's half-sister, you know, her father, Jefferson's father, had six children with a woman named Betty Hemings, who was Sally Hemings' mother, three girls and three boys, and Sally was the youngest. So, so she was, he was Jefferson's wife's half-sister. And um, people posit that this may have been part of it. He really, he was very, very much attached to his wife. Um, and when she was dying, she asked him not to get married again. She made him promise, and this is the family folklore again, the oral history of the family, that she made him promise not to get married again because she did not want to have another woman, she said, over her children. It wasn't so much, I don't want you to have anybody else, it's that I don't want another woman. Her mother uh, had been her father's first wife. Her father, when women died, men just got married again. And she, his, her, her father had three wives. And so she had two stepmothers. And evidently, she did not have a good 
time with them. And so she asked Jefferson not to remarry, and he never did. So that might influence, too, the way he thought about her. He clearly treated the Hemings family much better than those six people were treated differently than other people at Monticello. So that's, that goes into what he may have, what he may have thought about her. Um, it's an interesting field right now. People are doing a lot of work on Charlottesville and that whole area. And there's a, there's a, a piece in, in um, there was an anthology done after my book came out uh, called Sally Hemings and Thomas Jefferson instead of Tom and Sally. They just switched the, the, uh, um, the, the title around. And there's an essay in there about Charlottesville and it talks about interracial couples that lived in Charlottesville. Uh, one of them was Sally Hemings' sister, a woman named Mary Hemings. Jefferson went off to Paris, and when he went off, a number of his slaves were, and this is offensive, but this is what happened, were leased out to people in the town to work for people in the town. And Mary Hemings went into Charlottesville and began to work for a man named Thomas Bell. And while she was there, they began and for lack of a better term, a relationship. When Jefferson comes back, she asks Jefferson to be sold to this guy. So Jefferson sells her to Thomas Bell, and they live on Main Street in a house. She bears children for him. When he dies, he leaves them the property and the house, and nobody bothers them. I mean, this is a guy that Jefferson knew and respected. He's in his correspondence, Thomas Bell. So this is a couple. These are people who live together on Main Street openly and have kids. There, are not, there was another couple who were in the same kind of relationship, but they started to buy property together. And when they started to buy property together, someone made a complaint, swore out a complaint against them. And they were fined. Nobody was put in jail because, you know, they're not Fornication, miscegenation was against the law, but fornication was too, you know, living, having sex outside of marriage. Um, so it seems to be that as long as people kept this stuff secret and didn't do anything that signaled, hey, we're acting like a married couple, they were left alone. And certainly nobody was going to bother, go up to Monticello and, you know, bother Jefferson about anything like this. So, I mean, again, a long answer to your question. <laughs> yes, I've thought about it, and when I'm working on this book, I'll have to think about it some more, because that really, it wasn't the focus, but I raised it just for the, qu for the reason that you did, is that there seems to be a problem on the part of some of the people who, you know, who were looking at this with this notion that he could have been committed to her. That really, really rankles them. I think I might be able to hear you. I'll repeat your question if... I wondered if you worried um, in the opposite direction that by having this kind of candy-coated story of this loving relationship mm -hmm. that it allows Monticello to present slavery in a very benign way mm -hmm. and that then allows every other plantation owning family to say that we were just the same and we took care of our slaves and we intermarried or we just you know mm -hmm. we treated them very well and we had loving relationships with them mm -hmm. does it worry you that you you know that this is handed to them on a plate oh absolutely I mean, that's the reason that I said, I mean, I really have to think about this. And it, what it involves is finding out more about the history of that area, about the context, about these kinds of relationships that I mentioned before. You know, what is, I just, I did an essay. I have a new book coming out called Race on Trial. This month, as a matter of fact. Um, it's a book of, of essays. And I, I didn't write all of them. I mean, I, I edited it. My essay is about a woman named Celia. And this is a woman in Missouri who was put on trial and eventually hanged for killing her master after years of sexual abuse. It's one of those things where he bought her, she's 14 years old, they're on the way home from the sale and he rapes her on the way home. It's clear what he's bought her for is, you know, for sexual purposes. She has a couple of children by him and one night she tells him, she, actually she falls in love with another slave on the plantation and this man tells her, you know, you've got to break it off with with Robert Newsom, the master. Well, how is she going to do that? You know, this is not like, you know, today or whatever. I mean, so, but he's insistent. He's very jealous. And so she tells this guy, if you come to my cabin tonight, I'm not having sex with you anymore. And he says, you know, I'll do whatever I want to do. 
He comes to her cabin. He tries to have sex with her. She kills him, burns him up in the fireplace, spends the entire night burning his body in the fireplace. The next morning, his grandson is playing in the yard. She says, hey, you know, I have a lot of ashes in my fireplace. Would you help me remove them? And so the guy comes, the little boy comes, and he's helping her move these ashes. They're his grandfather, you know, and throwing them out back into the woods. Um, Celia is one thing, right? Uh, Mary Hemings, who asks Jefferson to be sold to this guy so that she can have kids with him, and then he dies and leaves her the house. He doesn't free her, because if he frees her, then she's a free black woman living in his house, which you can't have. And then there's Sally, we don't really know anything about. There has to be, you have to put all of these kinds of things in context. What you don't want to do is, I think that the Mary Heming situation obviously is an anomaly. That's a rare, rare thing. It was much more like Celia's situation, not that they killed them and burned them up in the fireplace, but this sort of, you know, this is, these are sexual toys. We have absolute power over these people and we can do what we want. That was in the main. The, d the difficulty is, the, the trick is to try to figure out what is going on, what, is Sally, what are Sally and Tom like? Are they more like Mary and T Thomas Bell, the really anomalous situation, or is it just Robert Newsom and Celia? And what I try to do in the book is to say, let's, let's think about this for a second, because there's a, everybody has a stake in picking one or the other right off the bat. The people will tell you this is, you know, you know, there's no way for this person to consent. This is, she couldn't have felt anything for him. He couldn't have felt anything for her. And then there are people on the other hand, it's like the miniseries. You know, there was a miniseries on Tom and Sally. And that was, I mean, it was a miniseries, right? I mean, is it followed the, cause she could have been an English girl in, you know, the man, Lord of the Manor. I mean, it was it, it followed all the conventions of a miniseries. Essentially, it had nothing to do really with what slavery was like, and um, and you're right. You don't want that because that's people want a good people want to feel good about a bad situation. I mean, that's an understatement to describe slavery as a bad situation. But you know what I mean. You want to let's look on the bright side of things, but you don't want to look on the bright side of things because there weren't very many bright sides, but when you're writing someone's life, you want to make sure that you don't just take the big picture and swallow up the nuances that could or could have been there. And uh, that's the real danger. And as far as Monticello goes, there are people on staff there who are pretty vigilant about this. They really, I mean, they were really up in arms about that miniseries. Uh, and I sat, I went out to Ohio, and they had a big sort of Hemings family reunion, about 700 of them, and they screened this film. And Cinder Stanton, who I mentioned before, and Diane Swan Wright, who's a black woman who's in charge of African American you know, presentation at at um, at Monticello. I mean, they were just climbing the walls about that. She said, "This is horrible. You know, how how am I going to do my job now that millions of people have seen this and they think that you know they have these cabins that look like they're in like Southampton, you know, <laughs> these little, little things around and and everybody's just living and loving, and it's like." That's not what you want to present, um, but I, I, I really do fear it. But on the other hand, as a writer, when I see something, I can't say, you know, there's some, I can't deny what I, my, ver my understanding of human nature to make a point that is essentially a political point. It's a necessary one, but it's a, it's a tough balance. I, I also want to do a uh, voice is really loud. Um, I also wanted to applaud you. I thought that was a wonderful talk, and um, I, I was thinking about academics and sort of academics that I've seen in, in, in programs that I've been in, and the sort of leftist, the risk and the chance that are that, that's taken by being on the left. And, mm -hmm. um, your courage is, is is admirable. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> it's a comment and a question. Um, following up on, on um, the question that was just asked, you know about the the, the possibility of, of something that's benign. I mean, I, I also think that we also have to be mindful that we already have benign models 
of um, the depiction of slavery. Mm -hmm. Uncle Tom's Cabin, um, Huckleberry Finn, et cetera. I mean, those are very benign versions. Um, and, and when I think about <clears throat> um, slavery and what's allowable, um, as a writer, <clears throat> you know, we look at someone like um, Toni Morrison or, or, or Charles Johnson, The Middle Passage or Song of Solomon, and um, you have the other side of what's benign um, as far as the depiction. But still, it gets relegated to fiction mm -hmm. in, in, in the end. Um, and I guess w w I'd be really curious about the possibility of a book. Because, I mean, really what we're talking about some, is weaving um, something that is not benign into the fabric of our country. Mm -hmm. I mean, w we have a recent you know, blatant example of um, um, not acknowledging the slavery and in, in our, our lack of participation in the, uh, in the conference in in Durban. Mm -hmm. So we already have that. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I guess in, in the end, what, what I'm saying is, one, I would, I would love to see um, something written by um, someone who is black, which, is, w which speaks um, to slavery in a way that um, Toni Morrison does or Charles Johnson, but, but that, that just, in the end, doesn't just get relegated to fiction, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, and also, have you, have you ever thought about doing a book on slavery and, and the law? Uh, or. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, yes, I have. I mean the, I mean the book that I mean you mean like a, the book that's coming out is it's race on trial, law and American, uh, law and culture in American history. It's, it was really about race. It takes all of the the famous sort of cases involving race and their separate essays about them. But I definitely want to do a book about. Um, you know, s slavery and the law, because I teach the class, mm -hmm. and I'm working on, you know, various articles right now, and that, that is something that I definitely plan to do, because it's the one, I mean, the, the scholarship on slavery right now is really the most vibrant and burgeoning area um, that's going, and the one area that is sort of just taking off is slavery and the law. People don't understand how yeah. law yeah, interacts with culture, how it shapes it, and because it's sort of a specialized field, it's easier to talk about the other stuff. And the law requires you to know something about, <laughs> you've got to read the statutes, you've got to do all of the kind of stuff. But th I think it's crucial, and I'm definitely going to do that. Because it's the part that, of slavery that's really been left out 